are downstairs, but that's closed. Normally we're saying, hey, listen, find a member and they can bring you downstairs. So who's a member of the club? Well, so look a bit at that, maybe the next time. Anyway, <laughs> let me start off. My name is Martin Kraus. I'm a board member here. I'm on the conservation committee, and it's a great pleasure to have you here and Joseph as well. So seeing that there are new people here, the Explorers Club was created in 1904, mainly by polar explorers. And since then, we have evolved quite a bit. We have the famous five firsts, the first to the North Pole, South Pole, Mount Everest, Mariana Strange, and the Moon have all been members. There you see a sled that Perry took to the North Pole or close to the North Pole. Here we have a flag from Apollo 13. Uh, so it is uh, a great place for explorers. We have about 4,000 members around the globe. And I met Joseph a couple of years ago, and it's really interesting. It fits quite well with the club. I don't know if some of you know, we started, we have the annual dinner. Well, next year, we'll have the 120th. And part of that, we always had hors d'oeuvre that were a bit different. So in 1932, but it was not for the curiosity. In 1932, we had apparently the first insects. But there were people coming back from the field and wanting to show other people here, hey, what are people eating there? What do we have? And there are stories in the New York Times in 1950, we apparently served Willie Mammoth's broth. And so it has continued. I think at one point the insects went a bit for Instagram, for other things, and I think that's really interesting where Joseph is coming in now. I think we're making a circle. I think conservation, many of the explorers are coming back from the field and you realize, hey, listen, we really need to do something about our world. What we see there culturally, what we are seeing there in terms of habitat, something needs to be done. And I think that is where he comes in very importantly. So I think many of you probably know from Brooklyn Bugs, Joseph is an edible insect ambassador, a renowned chef. Okay. I think we are, yeah. I think he is a sword leader in the insect agriculture, and I think that's where it's really getting important. How can we eat better? How can we help the planet survive a bit better, have more sustainable ways of doing things, deal with climate change, deal with uh, biodiversity? So uh, I think let me, yeah, I think we have in the end afterwards, you can pick up a journal that's uh, where we feature Joseph. I think Angela did that. Is she here? Yeah. There's Angela, so she did an interview with him. And I think another exciting thing, and then I let the floor to him, we have a charity buzz uh, auction going on. If you want to have a dinner for 10 people where Joseph is going to serve his food, you can do that, and he's going to do a workshop as well. I think we have a couple of signs around. But so let me give the mic over to Joseph, and looking forward to his presentation. Thank you so much, Martin. I really appreciate it. And more importantly, thank all of you for being here. It really is so special. And I'm actually going to use this podium because uh, we're live casting on Facebook and, and uh, into the world. So uh, OK. Let's uh, get situated. All right, everybody. Well, thank you so much for coming to the Explorers Club. It really is a great honor to be here. And I just became a member this spring, and Martin was, one, was my sponsor along with David Easerman. So it's really great to, to see Martin uh, being able to introduce me. To answer this question, can eating insects save the planet? I heard a giggle, and it is kind of, it could sound kind of preposterous almost, but let's, uh, let's get started and, and see how we feel about this, this whole idea. So I hope that you guys enjoyed the, excuse me a second, hope you guys enjoyed the bug d'oeuvres that were served <laughs> earlier, and we just try to connect with as many ways to familiarize ourselves with the very notion of insects as food. Um, quick show of hands, uh, how many of you guys liked what you ate? OK, all right, good. Um, I appreciate honesty above anything else. And so 
If you have comments uh, to share with me later, please feel free to share them with me. Um, and how many of you have intentionally tried eating edible insects before? Okay, wow, I am in some good company. <laughs> well, what we're going to do today, we're going to go over edible insects, a little insect agriculture, talk about sustainability, a little philosophy about me, gastronomy, and the path forward. So the following pictures are of my food and journals, media, and events that I've been covering Brooklyn Bugs. And I think that more importantly than can eating insects save the planet, I think a more appropriate question is can eating insects actually save the planet? Uh, just a quick show of hands. Uh, does anyone here think that eating insects can save the planet? You won't hurt my feelings. Okay. <laughs> All right, we'll take a poll later on and see how you guys feel. OK, one big thing that I like to emphasize is that this isn't a linear process, where a lot of times people are like, Joseph, what's the one thing that will get everyone eating insects? And this is the furthest thing from a linear process or arithmetic. And it's really interdisciplinary calculus. And so you'll have to bear with me as I wax poetic about the intricacies of transforming a global mindset towards eating insects. And so it is truly an exciting time for entomophagy or eating insects. And I'll even go as far as to say that the world has collectively never spoken more about eating insects than at this very present moment. If you guys do eat insects, or have eaten them, or enjoyed some today, you're in good company, because 80% of the world's nations and billions of people around the world regularly consume insects. A really big part for us to be able to actually incorporate it and think about insects as food is that we have to reimagine what it looks like. No one wants to think about eating a big bowl full of crickets or cockroaches, I think, on a regular basis. But what if we were to reimagine and think about what it can look like to be more recognizable as food that we currently enjoy? But a really big point that I want to emphasize is that edible insects are not just for humans, but also applicable for insect agriculture. Is that a familiar term for any of you out there? Yeah, it, it's a relatively new idea because a lot of times people think that insects are a vector against good agricultural practices. But we're going to break this down. I'm going to share a little bit more about what's happening, the innovation and incredible potential of insect agriculture with you. So in 2013, the UN's FAO, Food and Agricultural Organization, issued this report, Edible Insects, Future Prospects for Food and Feed Security. And here I am, very fortunately, with Dr. Arnold Van House, the main author of this report. He's kind of like one of my superheroes, um, incredible scientist. He's kind of my North Star of, of the work that I do around edible insects and insect agriculture. So in this report, it talks about the big year, 2050. How are we sustainably going to feed the world's population by 2050? And it does not suggest that eating insects is a silver bullet that will like solve all the problems, but it could be among the solutions to address food security, sustainability, environmentalism, and workforce activation and livelihoods. And so I think another question that I'd like for you to consider is, what impact can eating insects and insect agriculture have on global food systems? So before I begin, I just thought I would share a little bit of background on myself, because I think that both the ethnographical information on who's speaking better informs you about uh, who I am and can give you a better idea of like the, where I'm coming from. And food has always been such a big part of my life and my family life. 
Here's a little baby Joseph at one years old. And I feel so fortunate to have found something that has been a continuation of a very big passion and something really meaningful to me and my family uh, throughout my entire life. And I first started my adult life working in the entertainment industry, and I had my own company called Spectrum Music, and I worked as an artist manager. That's really where I learned a lot of my business acumen and how I, um, yeah, a lot of my business skills. I did not manage David Bowie, just in full, full transparency, but this is a moment where, um, yeah. Um, and then in 2011, I started Yummy Eats, which is a, a private chef and catering company. And I really loved not just cooking, but I really loved to share and serve food. To see my mom and my aunts and my grandmother just loving to serve food that is like in my DNA and just the, the pure joy of service because there are a lot of chefs that only like to cook and they don't like to be on the service side of things. But I, I really enjoy that aspect and I think that's one of the things that really allowed for me to, to thrive as a private chef. And in 2017, I started Brooklyn Bugs and it originally started as an art project to conquer the fear of eating insects by eating them. <laughs> you, you almost can't make this up. And the artist, Miru Kim, I, I really respect her tremendously, and she asked me to, to work on this project, and I said yes immediately, not knowing about the FAO report, the FAO report. And for me to be able to think about normalizing edible insects, and to think about how this work can impact the UN 17 Sustainable Development Goals, that's going to have a real impact and be really incredibly motivational and inspirational for me. And my life has changed dramatically over the past six years since I have been working at Brooklyn Bugs. I found this great purpose and motivation and inspiration working as an edible insect ambassador. And I thought it was very important not to be an insect chef or just identify as a chef, which is my vocation, but an ambassador is able to be inclusive and work in a bigger community-orientated inclusivity. And I thought that was like really important so that people don't think, oh, He's got secret recipes and he's got this thing. You know, for me, it was vital because of the necessity of trying to expand and grow and normalize edible insects on a global scale. And so our approach, like a lot of times people ask whether I have a restaurant or a consumer packaged good, some food, and our focus has been on advocacy, outreach, and education. And it's really been an incredible honor for me to be able to do what I do in that capacity. Because if I were selling a product like, oh, eat these, my Brooklyn Bugs chips, it would be a very different thing than being able to be a thought leader and be able to present ideas that work towards solutions that work in a collaborative manner. And so that, that was a really big part of, of our growth in, at Brooklyn Bugs. And I'm tremendously grateful to travel around the world speaking at universities, museums, and conferences. And I'm so full of gratitude to share what we are doing with a global audience. And when I say we, uh, I'm not crazy or flippant about, it's because there are so many people that are involved with what we are doing in insect agriculture, all the scientists and academics and I love to celebrate them like rock stars. The industry and the media, there are so many people that are working so hard to do what we're currently doing right now. And I actually just returned on Thursday from a six week tour and um, had an incredible month 
in Australia and have literally never had an entire country welcome me quite like they did working with the Queensland Department of Agriculture and Fisheries, the Entomological Society of Queensland, Queensland Museum, South by Southwest, Sunshine Coast BioBlitz, um, and also a really big um, residency with University of Adelaide. And we were able to bring together academia, the industry, government, and the media. And to me, those are the four pillars for impact and change. And so it's really incredible for us to be involved in that kind of um, action in Australia. Um, I certainly wasn't expecting to be on the, the front page of a, of a local newspaper in Australia. And really, the, the interest in Australia and around the world has, has really, truly, truly been amazing. So let, let's break this down a little bit and talk about what insect agriculture is. Uh, yeah, let, let's talk about what is insect agriculture. And one of the really big ideas is that it presents an opportunity for circular and regenerative agriculture. And we could take organic waste from restaurants, from breweries, from bakeries, from uh, produce at groceries, and feed them to black soldier fly larvae. And we can eliminate them from going into our landfills and they can eat this organic waste at a rate that's exponential they can grow 15,000 times their original size without emitting methane gases i mean incredibly efficient and the next step though is that they, these larvae can be used for animal feed, for pet food, and for aquaculture. And we've passed legislation in America to be able to do that. And not only are we able to give a more nutrient-dense food for our livestock and for our pets, but they're more sustainable. And also, they, um, it, it decreases the deforestation in the Amazon from, from animal feed that we need, that, that, we're, that, we're, uh, that we're raising the Amazonian forest for, for animal feed. And how many of you guys are familiar with the idea of frass or the word frass? Okay, let's see a couple hands. Um, it's poop. If we're creating metric tons of insects, there's going to be a byproduct, which is frass. And it is an incredibly efficient organic bio, bio organic fertilizer that decrease, that mitigates the chemicals in our waste streams from traditional fertilizers. And the real gold star is that it also improves our soil health. And so you're starting to see the circular ag system that insect agriculture can present to work alongside other ag systems. So again, we could de decrease deforestation, maximize land use, and really place a great emphasis on conservation. So why are edible insects considered sustainable? Essentially, they require far less resources by way of water, land, feed, than traditional livestock, and emit a fraction of the greenhouse gas emissions compared to traditional livestock. And one of the concepts that I really love to emphasize Minimum input for maximum output with great intention and respect. Not taking the cheapest thing that's out there, but to think about how can we sustainably continue to live with respect for our environment and the world around us. And sometimes when I talk about sustainability, people think that it requires them uh, to eat insects like every day to make an impact. But if you are familiar with the idea of meatless Mondays, even eating insects just once a week can make a tremendous impact on the environment. As far as the health and nutrition goes, crickets, as one in example, have all nine essential amino acids. They're high in protein, anywhere from 50 to 80% protein by weight, contain iron, potassium, 
vitamin B12, and also has prebiotic chitin. Going back to the, the foul report, another really big important thing is food security. And when I was just um, traveling, I, I, I do a lot of work at universities, and I heard a really alarming like statistic at how many grad students and PhD candidates are, are food insecure. And I think it gives us a great deal of sensitivity and empathy to think that people around us may be ashamed to think or say that they are food insecure. And I think that most of us here, hopefully, have, are able to eat three meals a day. But there are a lot of people that don't have that capability. And just thinking about how insects, amazingly, can play a role in global food security is like a really big, uh, a, a really big motivation and, and inspiration for me. The potential for workforce activation and livelihoods around the world is also a tremendous benefit of insect agriculture. And there are a lot of instances and case studies where we have, uh, there, there's a Insects for Peace in Colombia. They're giving former cartel members an opportunity to work on insect farms. And they're able to use that BSF regenerative circular ag model and sometimes it's their, their wives. And we're seeing the impact of this where if, for, for a lot of women that might start a micro farm with insects that don't have another resource for jobs around the world in rural areas, they are able to start by getting rid of their organic waste, having that food for the chicken and other like livestock that might be around, utilizing the frass for fertilizer, being able to start selling this, and their, their profile and visibility in the community rises because of what they're contributing, and the impact that this really provides is, is really, truly incredible. So what I'd like to share is that eating insects and insect agriculture truly has unlimited potential, especially because we're at such a fledgling stage of this industry. And what I love is that edible insects can capture the interest and intrigue of pretty much 100% of people I talk to. It's not a hyperbole, but I've never like mentioned edible insects and had someone go like, I just don't care. There, there's usually <laughs> some opinion related to it. But what I love is that insect agriculture connects us with such incredible, viable solutions in global food systems. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the food. And have you ever thought about why eating mold? How many of you have eaten mold, like cheese and fungus, like mushrooms and bacteria, lactic fermentation, sea bugs? If you notice the, the arthropod shellfish allergy warning, uh, I mean, lobsters, crabs, shrimp, they're all arthropods, just like insects. How many of you like uh, insect regurgitation? <laughs> Honey. So why is eating insects so weird if we're willing to eat insect regurgitation, really? <laughs> So I, I think that a really big, big key to this is that education and the outreach to change minds and create the behavioral change and have the cultural sensitivity and empathy to be able to think about new ideas and also respect that millions upon hundreds of millions upon billions of people eat insects. And so we really love to work with people and children of all ages, really before they develop this cultural aversion. So how many species of edible insects are there? How many of you think that there are uh, at least a thousand species of edible insects? Um, how many of you think there are under a thousand? Okay, how many of you don't care? No, 
Um, there are over 2,000 species of edible insects with wildly different flavors and textures and functionality. But we have to make edible insects delicious to create behavioral change. I cannot reasonably expect to say insects are uh, sustainable and they're nutritious, uh, why, why, why don't you eat them? And that just doesn't hold enough water. We have to make what we're substituting be as good, if not better, in order to reasonably expect people to make this change. And one of the tropes that we battle is like, oh, you want to take away our meat? And it's like, no. <laughs> we want to add and diversify your diet, diet, not take something away. And one of the things I love to emphasize if you want to cook with insects is to have fun and appreciate the new ingredients and new flavors, the new textures and everything that it comes along with over 2,000 new ingredients. And something else that I love is that they don't only enhance and improve the nutrition, but also the texture and flavor of your food. And what I love is the incredible versatility. I hope that seeing a lot of these pictures of the food that I'm sharing, you could see that, wow, you can make it for breakfast, lunch, dinner, and dessert, snacks, late night snacks. The potentials are limitless. And the only limitation is with your own imagination. American, Italian, Korean, Mexican, French. Uh, literally, I, have made, I try to make every single dish I have ever made and bugify it. <laughs> How do I substitute and add insects into every dish I've ever created? However, eating insects doesn't have to be all the things. I think all too often people are like, oh, you're, but you're eating it in a cookie. It's like, yeah, so what? It's really good. And sometimes because it's nutritious, people think it always has to be in something nutritious, but we know that's not the case. And so I love that insects can also really deliciously fulfill a lot of guilty pleasures. And also you can highlight the insects like we have here in this garlic cicada, or you can hide it like this cricket green goddess sauce. And that's another thing that sometimes people are like, oh, you can see it. Oh, I don't want to see it. And you know, there, there are no rules. You could do whatever you want. And a lot of times, um, I like to do both. Um, I hope that some, you know, I apologize that um, I think some of the food um, was devoured early. <laughs> uh, I, I, I hope that for those of you that uh, I apologize if you weren't able to get a sample of the insect kimchi. But this is something that's very dear to me. And I love that I've been able to substitute the fish sauce or, or seafood that is used to create the umami in kimchi with insects. And I just love that when I first went home during, during COVID and saw my mom, I brought home some insect kimchi. And she was like, oh, son, this is delicious. What kind of fish sauce did you use? I was like, mom. I use insects, and uh, <laughs> I, I knew I was onto something when my mom uh, really appreciated the flavor and thought that it was like real kimchi, but being able to utilize insects, I knew that I was onto something. So I hope that I'm able to demonstrate a wide variety uh, of culinary applications with pictures from the, from the slideshow. And in case you want to see more, there's this episode, How to Eat Every Edible Insect, and yes, I do literally eat all 2,000. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, but yeah, you can, <laughs> you can watch this episode here. And what has the public reaction been? And it's been very varied. If people are coming expecting and wanting to see me, then it's usually quite eager. There are events that I do where um, I might be working with the American Museum of Natural History with Lou, who was here with the, uh, the insect petting zoo. Yeah, <laughs> give it up for Lou. And, and sometimes people get really 
bugged out. I have literally had people come and curse in my face, telling me to get out of here. What are you doing? And they're using more colorful language, but I'm, you know, here. Um, and I'm okay with that. And so, you know, one of the really big things I like to emphasize, and I don't mean to sound flippant about this, but I don't need you to like me, or, or even my food, for that matter. And a really big part of why is because this is so much bigger than me, it's so much bigger than Brooklyn Bugs, or even eating insects. When we're talking about food security and food justice, sustainability, environmentalism, health and nutrition, workforce activation and livelihoods, these pillars inspire me and continue to give me the conviction to keep going and not let the naysayers like even bother me. And something I like to emphasize is that we all have a role in how our actions impact the world around us. And one of the greatest ways that we can decrease our carbon footprint is by going on a plant-based diet. But that's unrealistic. I don't really expect everybody in the world to go like, okay, let's be sustainable and go plant-based. But we can start making the small actions even once a week that can make an impact not only on the environment, but in our lives and how other people can also relate to us as well. And something I like to emphasize is that every single academic, scientific, and culinary discipline can get involved with insect agriculture. We need every single one of you. And it's something that is really important for me to emphasize, because a lot of times people think this is just for chefs or maybe just for entomologists to get involved in. But every single one of you can have a role, even if you were to share this amongst your friends. That's like peeling the layer of the onion to, so that they'll start seeing like, oh, yeah, I saw Martin eating insects. Maybe I'll give it a try. You know, they say it takes seven points of engagement to adopt new ideas. And every single time that someone sees a new idea, it's more likely that they'll be open to accepting this new idea. And so you all can have a big part in the transformation around America. And so we really encourage cooperation. And as the industry is growing at the rate that it's going, it's uh, projected to grow from 800 million uh, last year to about 8 billion by 2030. And so there's tremendous room for, uh, for you guys to get involved. And what I really love is that when I say this, it's palpable because we are literally historically defining insect agriculture right now for humanity. Just like how most of you have never even heard of that term, for us to begin appreciating the potential and innovation of what it can provide in terms of solutions to work in our global food systems, I'd love to get you guys involved with this. Um, I'm really so happy to have worked with so many different institutions, and and uh, I'm really honored to now add the Explorers Club to this long list of um, institutions that I've received grants, residencies, and given presentations for over the years. So I'm really grateful, if you've noticed a lot of the press that's happening, uh, because it helps to change public opinion and, and better inform people. And before I started working with insects, I feel like I, I kept seeing creepy crawly, ooh, ick, ooh, disgusting, why are people eating this, it's sustainable. And now we're starting to see this evolution in the way that journalists are reporting this with better tools and assets and language to help them quite simply talk about this as food, not as some disgusting, sustainable experiment. So what I would really love to encourage of you is to dream the impossible. I think that so much of my life, as I said earlier, has changed in the past six years. And I'd like to share some of these examples of things that have, have happened in the past uh, six years. 
that allow for me to really dream the impossible. Insects that Feed the World is a biannual conference, and it was amazing to be the culinary director. And we had 600 participants representing 58 countries last year. I just love to see the representation from so many different countries. And we're really so excited to be going to Singapore next year for the next Insects to Feed the World conference. I feel very fortunate last year to be, have been the culinary advisor to the Methuselah Foundation in support of NASA's Deep Space Food Challenge. I think as a private chef or artist manager, I never ever would have dreamed of ever working on a program with NASA. And these are just examples of really believing in yourself and not giving up. I can't even tell you how many people, maybe not now, but for the first like three, four, even five years have been like, Joseph, you're not going to do anything with this. That's crazy. You're never going to go anywhere. Like people have tried doing this, like getting people to eat bugs and well, not to mention that we've been eating insects since the beginning of human evolution, really. Um, but this is really another aspect just to really emphasize to, to keep going. Uh, it's a real honor to also be the chef advocate for the United Nations uh, International Fund for Agricultural Development. And one of the things that I really, really love and appreciate is that we don't have to talk about the solutions for climate change through catastrophe. Oh, the world is going to end. Catastrophe, climate change, we have to eat bugs. <laughs> that would never work. And I love that I share this with EFAD, that we love to share the solutions of climate change through the prism of great hope and optimism. And I love that they're able to go to the areas of greatest need in the world, to the most impoverished rural areas, and I love to be able to amplify their mandate and mission. They also place a really big importance on small rural farmers and stakeholders, which is vital to our agricultural system and our ecosystem as well. I was at uh, COP28 is getting ready to come up. I was at COP27. Uh, last year, and I was really so honored to also give four presentations during that time. I never, in my wildest imagination, would have thought that I would be a member of the Explorers Club. And it's, it's really part of my own personal transformation and metamorphosis that I found myself in a position to be able to commit and contribute and really be a part of this really incredible historic and prestigious organization. It is really a tremendous honor for me to, to be here and to be a, as a member of the Explorers Club. So this year I've actually traveled for over a third of the year so far and I've been able to share my work on, on five different continents. And one of the really important things that I like to emphasize is that we share facts and science driven by storytelling with vision, purpose, and kindness. Because science is not static, we're constantly looking for new data and we're constantly trying to improve what we know. And even a year ago, when I look at some of the presentations I gave, some of that data has been updated since then. And so this is an in incredibly fast-moving and fast-paced industry that's continuing to find new data. So what are we hearing as we travel around the world? Unfortunately, globalization is negatively affecting cultures that have traditionally eaten insects. There's a sense of shame associated with eating insects. When I was in Thailand earlier this year, I thought it was the Mecca of eating insects, I was so excited to go there, and it was so disheartening to see what people would say. Oh, edible insects, those are for tourists, and they're just for poor people in marginalized communities and, and rural areas. 
And it, and it quite frankly shocked me that people there were not proudly eating this. And I spoke at Kassasar University in Bangkok and I challenged them. I'm like, do you want to be a statistic among two billion people that eat insects? Or do you want to reclaim this proud heritage and become a global leader in insect agriculture? When I was in Egypt, uh, they were pretty adamant that they don't need insects. They're like, oh no, you're, you're thinking about other areas of Africa, not, not us. And what's interesting is that this woman, she invited me into her home, and does anyone want to guess what she's doing in this picture? Luca, Luca, <laughs> sifting insects out of the flower. And so through my translator, I, I told her why I was in Egypt, and we had a really interesting sort of laugh and discussion about this. But I am certain that Egyptians ate insects in ancient times. They have all these hieroglyphics of honeybees and scarab beetles. They were not wasting a single resource, and I know that they must have been eating the brood and the honeycombs, and maybe the scarab larvae. But the reason why I know is because in this exploration that I've been doing and speaking with Egyptologists, I actually got given an ancient Egyptian recipe utilizing locusts. And what this does, it allows for us to connect and normalize these ideas even more than thinking like, oh, that's other people, not, not us. And I had mixed reactions of eating insects in Ecuador, and this is in Sariaku in the Amazon, and uh, Rosa is actually trying to pick up the chantacudos, the palm weevils, uh, with chopsticks, because she, she's like, wait, how do you use chopsticks, chef? And so we're, we're working through the chopsticks, and what was really interesting is that when we started eating some of these, the, these palm weevils, a lot of the, the, the kids that were around and some of the adults started freaking out. They started screaming, right? Like, oh. And I was shocked. I was shocked because I, I was like, haven't you guys been eating this like forever? And they're like, yeah, but not so much anymore. And, and, it, and it was a really interesting to see how people are reacting around eating insects because of globalization. So what I'd like to emphasize is that we can be part of providing the solutions, amplifying indigenous voices and practices, and changing global perception, quite simply because a lot of people follow our example, for better or for worse. I mean, well, for the most part, for better. <laughs> and I think that one of the really important things is that cultural integration and influencers are integral to help us normalize the practice of eating insects. And each opportunity can help us to reach new audiences. And I would love to encourage you guys, you can also be the influencers. If you're eating the food, please share it online. Feel free to tag me. This goes a really long way in getting people to accept these newer ideas. And we certainly get trolled, but we generally and genuinely try to make our work apolitical. I mean, there's a whole conspiracy theory about, as you can see, about eating insects. And one of the things that I love to, to share when, when I get trolled, and to all the naysayers out there, my approach is, is quite simple. And I love to kill them with kindness. <laughs> kindness always wins, guys. And we have a willingness to appear where people may disagree with my work. And I went on Fox to talk about the conspiracy theory. And again, it shows an opportunity for how we can engage and try to get past this cancel culture 
where if we're, if no one's willing to have the conversation, then then we're we're just gonna what what's gonna happen? And so I'm willing to go and and really be a part, even and especially where people disagree with me. Otherwise, I'll just be talking in an echo chamber. And so this was like a very important uh, a very important part for me to to be able to go and and share my work on Fox. And so again, our, our focus is rooted in advocacy, outreach, and education, and uh, really through the practice of gastronomy. And one of the really great things that I feel so fortunate about is that I know we didn't serve any scorpions or tarantulas or wasps today, but there have been so many events that I've been to where I do serve them, and people will come up to me and be like, chef, I've had a lifelong fear of scorpions, and you literally helped me to conquer my fear. And what an incredible, special relationship to have a, with a diner as a chef, to have that kind of relationship. So friends, we love sharing our work, our joy, and optimism with you. Collaboration is at the very heart of what we do at Brooklyn Bugs, and we welcome the opportunity to discuss meaningful ways for us to be able to collaborate. And as I get ready to close, I, I want to think about whether we can positively impact the world. And just think about like what kind of feeling you leave behind after you engage with people. Think about like what our day-to-day -day actions can have and the responsibility we have as stewards for the next generation. And I emphatically believe that yes, we can positively impact the world. And I like to emphasize that everybody can be a change maker. And a lot of it starts locally or regionally. Because a lot of times when I speak at colleges, they, they don't feel empowered to be a change maker or they feel like voting doesn't matter, what they wear doesn't matter, what they eat doesn't matter. And I love to share that these very basic actions in our life make a really big difference and it empowers you to be a change maker in your own world and the influence you have around those around you as well. So this is a slide I have for college. I, I thought I would just kind of leave it up there because these are very important things that I think are really important to me as I travel around. And it might, uh, and it's just, I'm, I'll just read down them real quickly. To be kind and respectful, to be of service, to dream the impossible, to follow your heart, channel fearlessness, never give up, and really, very importantly, uh, don't take yourself too seriously. So my work with edible insects has led me to believe that, quite literally, Anything is possible. I'm not guaranteeing that is how you will feel by regularly eating insects, but I certainly welcome you to join me in trying. Just one bug at a time. <laughs> thank you, thank you. So. Can eating insects actually save the planet? I'm going to give this a wholehearted, emphatic yes. And I love to encourage you all to go fearlessly forward and to really think about, find that purpose, find that conviction to do what nobody else in the world can do but you to embrace it, and to fearlessly fight for what you believe, especially now more than ever, and be as beautifully and amazingly yourself as possible. So, um, I hope you guys enjoyed the insect petting zoo that was out there with Lou. Uh, really big special thank you to Lou for bringing that. And 
No one has been to more of my events ever than Lou actually here. Uh, so a really big thanks to Lou. And he is not a new newcomer here. Back in 1992, he was at the Explorers Club for the New York Entomological Society's centennial party, serving insects. He has a little more facial hair. <laughs> uh, but uh, th thank you very much, Lou. Thanks for being such a great supporter. And uh, a really big thank you to the Explorers Club. It is really such a tremendous honor to not only be a new member, but also to be able to speak at the really, uh, what I consider a, a very prestigious Monday lecture series. Um, it's, it, it's really, really incredibly special and meaningful for me to be here. So uh, a big thank you to, to uh, Kevin and to Felix and all the guys here that's at the Explorers Club. Uh, thank you very much. And it's a shameless photo of me hanging out with uh, the president, Richard, here. And also, to my two sponsors, uh, to be a member of the Explorers Club, you need two sponsors. And Martin, who you heard from earlier, and David Easterman were my sponsors. It, it really, um, Mar Martin's been a really great, uh, I, 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 I could go on and on about how encouraging and meaningful my relationship with Martin has been. And, and it's really, uh, I feel very honored, quite simply, that, that you're my you're my sponsor and my friend. Uh, thank you very much, Martin. And so, I guess, without further ado, um, do you have something you want to? No, I can do the question Q&A. Yeah. Oh, so I, I guess we are now ready for the Q&A. Yeah. All right, as I did the event, I have two questions for you as the MC. I think oh, okay. I'm intrigued being at the Explorers Club with all the astronauts. So what's the story with NASA? I think that's one of my questions. Okay. And the second one is, so if you look at a dish, if you have 500 calories, like a burger, mm -hmm. what is the carbon footprint of beef compared to, uh, of that burger compared to if you would do it with bugs? Yeah. So, so the first question, the NASA's Deep Space Food Challenge addressed the question of how are we going to actually travel to Mars? And... On the ISS, they have resupply missions, but to go to Mars, it's going to be like a two to three year mission, and you can't have resupplies. And so the Deep Space Food Challenge is a, a way to create a regenerative circular ag system uh, that was no more than two cubic meters, kind of the size of a refrigerator, powered by no more than an average draw of 1,500 watts, which is kind of like a uh, space heater, to help supplement the, the astronauts' diets. And so we're now in phase three of that challenge, and uh, so that, that's the overall premise, but some of the, some of the um, teams that are competing in this challenge are really quite simply genius and doing like really incredible work. And um, so, I, so I, I was briefly uh, participating as a culinary advisor for the program, and uh, it was really a, what, what an incredible experience. Uh, of note, I just met uh, someone from ESA, the European Space Agency, and they're the first ones to actually bring crickets, cricket bars, and cricket food uh, up to ISS. And so I'm hoping to be able to cultivate and develop that relationship a little bit and try to see if they'll bring some more insects up in space. Um, regarding the carbon footprint of, of insects, I mean, there, there are some like really dramatically different numbers based on like beef, chicken, or seafood, or crickets, mealworms. They're all like pretty varied. but it, it is like an alarming fraction of the resources. Um, they say it takes like 2,000 gallons of water to create a, a pound of beef, which is like kind of mind like boggling how, how all that water is necessary, uh, whereas it'll only take a gallon of water for a pound of crickets. And one of the things I wanna caution you when I, when I say these things, I'm not trying to get rid of the beef industry because I think that's just quite simply impossible. Or like not, you know, there there's a lot of cattle farmers and the industry and that I respect and I want to support. And so how can we work in tandem and collaborate in creating collaborative ag systems? I think that's really a big point that I like to for for the takeaway, not that we're trying to, you know, indeed take away anything from you guys. 
Thanks so much for the presentation. It was incredible. Um, and if it's any inspiration, I know that lobster was once seen as an insect for poor people. So <laughs> if they can do it, you can too. Um, kind of the first half of your talk, this theme reverberated regarding normalizing and kind of like making bugs sexy as far as food and rebranding it really. And I kept thinking of the company Impossible Foods and the way that they kind of approached um, normalizing plant-based meat was really unique. They were scientists really, and as chefs and scientists, they um, approached like Bay Area restaurants one by one, really high-end restaurants, and provided them with uh, you know, their product, which at first was just plant-based beef. Um, and then now you can like find impossible foods at the supermarket, essentially varying from like beef, imitant beef to like imitant chicken and so on. Um, and I think kind of you said at some point in the talk that the best way to make people like it is to get them to eat it. I was wondering, have you ever thought about um, creating like a very simple line of a insect based product, whether that's like the cricket aioli or something that kept kind of resurfacing in the photos? Um, and selling them like locally in Brooklyn and kind of starting in that way to um, change that stigma? Yeah, thank you for the question. And I've been so focused and committed on advocacy, outreach, and education that I know so many chef friends have started a consumer package good and it becomes their life. And I knew that I did not want to be out there being a salesman. And, and I feel very fortunate to be in the position that I am as a thought leader around the work that we're doing. Uh, but I'm really so grateful that through um, partnerships and relationships that I have that um, I just did a semester long case study at Cornell and the Dyson Grand Challenge and they took on Brooklyn Bugs and, and the seniors in the, the College of Business, uh, uh, the seniors uh, did, did a project and just gave me uh, incredible feedback on how to diversify my revenue streams. And also, um, I'm so fortunate that Google has been so incredibly supportive and also helping me in how I can like um, expand and think about creating product and diversifying my revenue streams. And so with that, I feel very like, when I was alone, no. Or even with like some other people, that my, the idea of creating something was challenging. But with these partnerships I'm developing, I am getting ready to put some things out probably next year. Yeah, thank you. Martin, do you want to? I think Felix is. Oh, all right, OK. Yeah. Hey, Joseph. Hey, Bonnie. Hi. That was great, of course. Thank you. Uh, as was the food. So I have two very simple questions. One, where do I get the bugs to cook with? That is a great question. Um, they're all available online. And I have a few vendors that I they regularly use. Uh, Entosense are on ediblinsects.com. They have a wide variety of insects. Entomo Farms and Three Cricketeers are three of my most trusted uh, vendors. Right. And second, very quickly, is there a cookbook in your future? Um, it's funny that you should ask because um, we, you know, that's another thing that's been challenging for me because I, I've actually received publishing offers and I have not been able to accept them. And um, I feel so driven by the work that we're doing right now. It's been difficult to make the time, but I think that um, uh, 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 one of my mentors, Sonny Ramaswamy, uh, he was like, when I saw him in Seattle, he was like, Joseph, you, you have to be more selfish. You just have to make the time to write. And so um, I think I'm gonna travel a little less next year and, and indeed earnestly start the uh, writing process. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your presentation. It's really impressive. As an environmentalist, I really feel it's important to promote this, uh, to normalize the culture of eating bugs. Uh, one question I have, like, do you have, uh, out of the 2000s, like, edible pieces, uh, do you have like focus on like, working with local invasive species? I think this summer, like all the New Yorker, like pay attention to the lantern bug, for example, right? So I wonder if that's a way for people to get more aware and then put into action. I don't know if lantern bugs are edible, but yeah, my question. 
Yeah, I, I love the question. And ideally, I would love if all these invasive species were, were edible. But the spotted lanternfly eats, uh, what's that tree that they eat? It's like kind of noxious. It, yeah, the, it, it will it'll give you an upset stomach. Thank you. Uh, and, and also, they, um, they also secrete a distasteful chemical as well. And so they're, they're not really edible, per se, yeah. Um, are chemicals and pesticides the answer? I, I, I don't think so. I mean, there, there are a lot of scientists that I work with that work on uh, insects to combat other insects. Like, what, what are more natural ways that we can think of these solutions? And I think that just being able to think about these things in, in manners that don't rely on the heavy usage of chemicals and all these things that, that we've used. And, you know, to, I, I think it's like this. When I talk to my family members or, or other people about, like, not using so much plastic and, and catering, uh, we used to use plastic wrap on everything and wrap things. And, and it's like, you know what? It's a little inconvenient not to use that, but to use Tupperware and wash it. I understand, so it takes a little more effort. But we owe it to ourselves. We owe it to the earth. We owe it to our children and our grandchildren, and the future generations, for us to think about the impact and not be so selfish. I think the selfishness that I was referring to earlier was just on, in, a, in a good manner, <laughs> not, not the bad one. So um, yeah. All right, I want to give the floor as well to one Explorers Club member, Justin, who is working on similar issues. Uh, ha happy belated birthday as well, Justin. Thank you so much, yeah. thank you. So one question is, I know when we're speaking about game meat within the US, uh, it has to be farm raised if it's gonna be served outside of a club atmosphere, whether it's a restaurant or a market. Are there any similar restrictions on with any of the edible 2000 species, and is it an umbrella that they can either be sold publicly or not be sold publicly. Yeah, so I am actually speaking at the FDA in December, and one of the things that I would like to encourage them is for a better regulatory framework. Because right now, the only way that insects are addressed in the FDA is as undesirable food. You can have 100 bits in your chocolate or ketchup or something, but they don't set up the framework for us to be able to address it as food. What are the best practices? And Right now, the, the, what we have to work with is that if something is reared for human consumption and it's processed at an FDA-approved facility and the scientific name is written, then it's considered deemed as food. Uh, but we need more policy and legislation to be able to win over big food producers to start getting involved so that they have the safety that they're not going to work with some species of insect and then find out like there's some obscure law that's going to prevent them or something. And so this is part of the interdisciplinary calculus that I talk about is like, how do we get the policy and legislation and the normalization and you know, just like all these things, but we're, we're actively working towards trying to get better, uh, better policy and legislation in place. Um, I have a few short questions. Um, so if I eat insects, I am a carnivore? Um, I, I like to say insectivore, entarian, entotarian, or uh, yeah. I mean, it, it, it's still open. There's, uh, but but technically, you it, if you eat all the other things, you'd be an omnivore. But there are vegans that I know that live an entirely vegan diet with the sole exception of eating insects, and they identify as ento vegan. Okay. Um, so that, that was the first one because I asked a friend of mine who is vegetarian or vegan and there was no reply and I didn't know if I insulted her. Um, so um, the second one is, um, well, there's two questions. One is, um, I know cockroaches like can live through nu nuclear disaster. Um, it, when you got hired, not hired, but the relationship with NASA um, for insects in outer space. Um, do they have cockroaches that come up on the space shuttle or rockets out into outer space and like live in the ship somewhere like they do on other 
ships, like do they survive out there? That's one question. And then my other question is, um, so in Brooklyn, um, I know that they go around spraying tons of insecticide, like once or twice a year we get emails that they're gonna spray around the neighborhood. So does that mean that we could not get a cookbook and then kill our local insects and eat it because that would be like non-organic, you know, like buying apples that are treated with insecticides as opposed, and would that be dangerous? Or is that part of the whole FDA thing that you're trying to get approved? Anyways, yeah. so those are my questions. Yeah, thank you for your question. Uh, one, I, I'm going to say there are no cockroaches, but I, I may be wrong. Uh, my guess is that everything is like so measured. Like you can't even eat bread on ISS because of the crumbs, right? You, you don't have any salt and pepper. They're like liquid salt and pepper. So they don't want any random foreign things. So I'm going to say unless it's for scientific research, they do not have random cockroaches in, in, in the ISS. Uh, two, we, we emphasize the importance of responsibly sourcing your food. So all the insects that we get are, are farmed or, or reared or harvested specifically for human consumption. And so we do not encourage you to go out into your backyard because there might be who knows what your neighbors are spraying, right? And so you don't, you, to, to avoid the risk of pathogens and contaminants, um, largely, I, I would, if you are like a very uh, resourceful person at home and you want to like rear crickets or mealworms, that's a different story. And there are a lot of like uh, modules and stuff online that you could, and resources that help you kind of navigate through that. But uh, to me, it's just like kind of like, do you want to try to rear a, a cow <laughs> at your home or do you want to go to the grocery? And you know, it's, it, it's, it's, a, it's always a little more complicated than the romantic idea maybe. And even for crickets, it uh, could be a little challenging. So yeah, cicadas. thank you. Well, the cicadas are, were forage, but yeah. Could you use a mic just for the oh, online? If, if yeah. I wanted to have an introductory insect dinner for my friends, a gourmet dinner to really turn them on to it, which insects should I order? Where do I find them? And how much do they cost? Are you a gourmet chef? No. Okay, that, that, well, number one, that's going to be a, a challenge for you in preparing a gourmet dinner if you're not a gourmet chef. But two, uh, what, I, what I would say is this, is... Um, I, I think I'm going to answer a little broader question. Just say, how many of you guys are have a modicum of interest in cooking with insects, maybe? A, a few, OK. So what I would say is this. I'll, I'll approach this question. Instead of going gourmet, how about we go with like, how, how should you start cooking with insects? Instead of trying to learn an entirely new recipe with a new ingredient, I would say go with your wheelhouse. If you are a master lasagna maker, if you are a master fried rice maker, whatever your like best thing is, what I said before, think about how you can bugify it. How can you successfully incorporate cricket powder into your marinara sauce and turn it into like a ragu or a bolognese? How can you add cricket powder to your pasta sheets? Or maybe you want the whole insects. Right, and so I think that there there are so many ways to do this, and the the price point of insects they they, they vary tremendously depending on the insect. It's like just like uh, chicken and beef are different costs and everything. We're still working towards reducing the cost because of the demand and supply and demand, and just like you know, next year I'm going to have this big global campaign. Hopefully, you guys can get involved with this. And it's going to be a, it's going to come from a, diff, a few different angles, but basically, I want the entire world to ask their grocery stores, "Can you carry some edible insects?" Because I I've spoken with like a lot of different grocery chain, like with, like with Kroger and with like various grocery chains, and and they're like, Joseph, if you want your product in our in our stores, you quite simply people need to ask. And so we want to come up with this big global campaign for everyone to ask the groceries, but also for us to have some pride about eating insects, and for us to be able to demonstrate that this isn't just for poor, marginalized communities, and really, at the end of the day, make eating insects sexy. Yeah. Thank you. 
Guys, I, I love this um, Q&A session because I know that um, we're, we're, we're going a little over on time, but I, I'll answer all your questions until they take me off the stage. <laughs> Um, you mentioned globalization. So what do you think about globalization changed the way people eat um, for maybe moving away from inste insects, both in, I guess, recent times, but also you mentioned ancient history with the Egyptians. So what do you think, whether it's ancient history or now, um, kind of influenced people moving away from eating insects? Well, I think that a lot of the cultural norms and what's accepted and looked up to has been driven by, in, 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 in modern times, by American culture and, and set the norms. And when people see that Americans don't eat insects or Europeans, and you know, they're like, oh. So there are even cultures that have a long history of being in. They're just like, as, as, they, as, as they start seeing, watching TV and getting exposed to other things, and they just realize like, oh, uh, they're not eating insects. Like we want to eat processed, packaged food that we could put in the microwave. Unfortunately, like that. I mean, is that really what what, what we're going to share? Or you know, I feel like we're making great moves to be more mindful about what we eat and how we eat, and being healthier, being able to source things more locally, cutting down on waste. And part of this is that there are so many ways for us to be able to show the respect and the dignity for people who eat something different, who look different, who believe in something different, and it gives us an opportunity to be able to be inclusive, to learn, and so I, I think that those are some of the challenges, I think, with, with uh, what, what I've been seeing when I travel around and, and seeing people like kind of move away from the practice of eating insects, and so that's why I think an opportunity like this for us to share and engage and be able to like consider like, okay, maybe a handful of you believe that you want to try eating more insects and maybe you're gonna, some of you are going to post it online and some of your friends will see it. You go online and read all these newspaper articles and watch these videos and maybe you'll start buying the products. It's like this, the change maker idea that each one of us have so much power to make that change. And so that's why I emphatically like encourage that and really, especially at colleges, I encourage people to find their purpose, and that's far more important than than like making money and something. So, um, yeah. Thanks. So I've been listening to you talk, and pardon me if you've addressed this, but I don't feel like I know how you got into bug eating. Oh yeah, thank you for asking. Yeah, so I. I've all, I, you know, sometimes people ask me when, when the first time I've ever eaten bugs was, and I, I don't even remember, because I, I think my friends would come from Mexico or Thailand, and we would try eating some insects. Um, also, certainly ate the mezcal worms, um, and you know, but I, I've always been open to it. When I would go to Mexico, I would eat different insects, and. Uh, six years ago, I was approached for an art project to uh, uh, to conquer a fear of insects by eating them. And so it's through that project and then going on to Google and then seeing the UN's FAO report and really understanding that edible insects can have a really big impact on global food systems. And so that, that was really what was a big motivation and inspiration for me to continue. I think are we doing a last question? You got Is it already on? Oh, yep, okay. <laughs> so um, I think a lot of, I'm assuming that a lot of the roadblock or like mental block that people have about eating bugs is because they think bugs are dirty. So you did touch on pathogens um, if you, you know, were to catch wild bugs in Brooklyn or whatever, but with the farmed bugs, are there any concerns mm -hmm. about foodborne illness? Um, we're, we're doing, we're working on the best practices and science to find out about that. And so far, they have far fewer vectors compared to mammals, which have far more complex sort of uh, biological, neurological, and physiological systems. And the insects pose far, far lesser threat. Um, so, uh, well, 
Thank you guys so, so, so very much for coming here. It's been really a great honor and a joy. And um, yeah, if you haven't gotten a copy, thanks again to Angela and the Explorers Club for donating copies of the Spring Journal, Transcendence. Uh, there's some really great um, explorers are included in there. And so uh, thank you again, and uh, have a good night, everybody.